And so we're moving right along here in Joseph Campbell's Masks of God, Volume 1, Primitive Mythology. We've already looked at the first chapter. Uh, the next chapter begins uh, Section 1, Part 1, uh, rather, which is called The Psychology of Myth. So first he's going to go into uh, the psychodynamics of how, myth, how he thinks myth works first, before he looks at the various transformations of it over time. And the introduction is called The Lesson of the Mask. So the book is called The Masks of God. And so now we have to discuss the lesson of the mask and what that means. Um, he talks about how um, once the mask is put on, when, when someone puts on a mask, they're not referencing a deity. They are the deity. And this is the, the, the core principle about the wearing of the mask and the lesson of the mask is that the mask is the deity. In tribal societies, when they put on the masks, they're representing deities. They are deities. They have disappeared into another dimension, an astral dimension or a mythological dimension, in which other beings with other eyes now speak through them and see through them. This enables the performance of behavior patterns that might not otherwise be the norm, that the individual might not otherwise ever do or enact. Um, because what the mask does is it flattens the three-dimensional personality. It takes the core three-dimensional human personality with all of its neuroses, psychoses, idiosyncrasies, and flattens it out into a two-dimensional glyph. Uh, so that you actually enter into, in entering into the mythic world, you're entering into a flatter world than the world of space-time and causality uh, with human subjectivities. And human subjectivities gets hollowed out, flattened out, turned into a glyph, a mask, and is basically two-dimensional. It's a flatter world. It's a world of stereotypes, cliches, archetypes, iconotypes, and all kinds of... Uh, typifications that simplify and compress. Myth, as McLuhan used to say, is actually a compression. It's not a complexification. It's a compression of historical and temporal and complex processes uh, that get compressed into glyphic form, uh, most often so that they can be remembered that way, oral traditions. We forget that much of what we've inherited from mythology has been transmitted to us by oral bards like Homer. And these guys can only remember these works if uh, the details are shorn away and things get compressed. Was there one Trojan War or many? Were there perhaps many conflicts between the Greeks and the Trojans? Probably, but it all gets compressed into one Trojan War. Were there many exoduses? Uh, were there many processes of the Hebrews crossing back and forth between Egypt and Palestine? Most likely, but it gets compressed into one single historical event with one compressed uh, iconic figure uh, Moses, who himself, note by the way, uh, has a veiled face after he uh, contacts and sees God and God impacts him. He has to wear a veil over his face. His face is erased uh, from that point on for the rest of his life. So the mask, um, as Campbell puts it in this chapter, um, is for people who are capable of play, like children are. He quotes this passage from Leo Frobenius where Frobenius says, imagine uh, a scholar professor alone in his study. He's got his, his babysitting his four-year-old girl there. Um, she keeps interrupting him. He says, here, take these three matches, uh, three wooden matches, and go play with them. So she takes them and pretends they're Hansel, Gretel, and the witch. Goes off. She's very quiet for a while. A little while later, she comes running, screaming into the room. And he says, what happened? What happened? She says, Daddy, the witch is out to get me. So for her, the, the third match has become the witch. Her ability to play as a child uh, is able to conjure forth the being and represent it as the match uh, doesn't refer to the witch or symbolize the witch. It is the witch for her. And Campbell says that children have this sense of play spontaneously, but that this sense of play needs to be taken up into the higher cultures where it gets ritualized in the form of ritual symbol and myth, which is a much higher degree of play. And he says that this is the reason why you have uh, temples, uh, dragons, and uh, demons and monsters on the outside of the temple to keep the people out who are capable, who are not capable of a willing suspension of disbelief. The spoil sport, in other words, the rationalist, the guy for whom Aristotelian logic prevails, A is not B, B is not C, but when it comes to mythology, A can very well be B, and C can very well be B also. Um, rationalists need not apply when it comes to mythology is the point Campbell wants to make here. Um, I think we should raise another point that Campbell doesn't raise in this chapter, which is uh, the negative possibilities of wearing the mask can also lead to an identification with the being. 
And when that happens, it can cause a psychosis or craziness to uh, ensue. Let's say that one, an individual has been cast in the role of, of Hamlet at the school play this year. Uh, and for some reason, the guy, can't, the guy thinks he's Hamlet, and he's Hamlet off stage and in between scenes and can't stop being Hamlet. Well, a certain craziness has gone on there because he's put on the mask of Hamlet, and he has been unable to take the mask off. This same thing, by the way, happened to Jim Carrey on the set of the Andy Kaufman movie Man on the Moon, where much to the annoyance of the cast and crew, he put on the mask of Andy Kaufman and kept pretending to be Andy Kaufman in between the takes. Uh, the crew didn't like it very much. Uh, they were pretty annoyed by it and exasperated by it. And he was rude to them, playing jokes on them and doing all sorts of ridiculous things. The mask unlocks behavior patterns that might be immoral, amoral, or something that the person not wearing the mask ordinarily would not ever do. And so there are dangers to wearing the mask that can lead to, that Campbell doesn't address here, that can lead to identification if it comes to be the case that the individual can't take the mask off. And I think in my book, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons, I wrote about this in connection with the cult of the dead celebrity, the great wave of celebrities that we saw with Elvis Presley first in the 50s, Elvis Presley, James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, who were individuals for whom wearing the mask of the public persona of the famous individual became a problem. And in some cases, I don't think they were able to take the mask off. I think Marilyn Monroe, it got harder and harder for her to take the mask off, and it swallowed her up, and eventually she killed herself out of ontological confusion about her identity. I think the same thing happened to Elvis Presley as well. Uh, he didn't know who he was. Well, who was Elvis Presley? What conduct was properly Elvisian? There came a time, for instance, when he was reading lots of books. He spent like a year reading all these New Age books, constantly reading, reading, reading. But his agent, Colonel Parker, uh, told him that such conduct is, is not becoming of Elvis. Elvis doesn't read. Elvis is not an intellectual. Get rid of this stuff. And under peer pressure to his friends, he caved in and burned all of his books. Uh, he couldn't take the mask off there. Um, so there is a danger uh, regarding the mask. Uh, it can activate behavior patterns. Uh, and this is, I think, Campbell's point, though, is that mythology is fundamentally not rational. It's irrational, and it unlocks irrational, pre-rational, and a-rational behavior patterns. And then so for the next chapter, he follows up on this kind of idea that myth is, is not for rationalists. Um, with chapter one, where he talks about the enigma of the inherited image, uh, which has to do with the a priori aspect of myth, whereas the next chapter following this that we'll deal with tomorrow uh, is on the imprints of experience, which deals with the empirical aspects of, of myth. But first he gets into this very interesting, I think, and fascinating discussion about the enigma of the inherited image, in other words, instincts, um, where he talks about, first off, he, he starts by saying that turtles, uh, turtles will come out of the one this was well documented at the time in 1950s black and white movies, showing turtles coming out of the waves, uh, out of the sea, going up on land, laying their eggs on land, returning to the sea. And when the eggs hatch, the baby turtles know immediately, without having to be instructed, they know immediately to get to the water very quickly as seagulls are circling up ahead waiting to get them. And they go for that water quickly. And Campbell says they don't need to be instructed. They already know once they hatch that the water isn't a danger to them and that they need to get to it. They know how to get to it. They've got the limbs and organs of locomotion to get them there, and they know to avoid the seagulls without ever having had to take a course or a class on how to avoid seagulls and run for the water. They don't have to do that. These are called the imprints of, uh, or the, the enigma of the inherited image. The, somehow, Sleeping in the nervous system of those turtles are, uh, is an a priori knowledge. We call it instinct, but it's an a priori knowledge that's already in there. He gives a second example where he talks about experiments done with baby chicks uh, who know to run uh, the moment a hawk flies overhead. They, they know to run immediately. If another bird does it, they won't run. And an experiment can be conducted where you can make it like a fake hawk, a paper mache hawk, let's say, and draw it across the coop, and they'll run. If you draw the hawk backwards, on the other hand, they, they won't run. Interesting comment about the possibility of how art and myth may work on the human nervous system. Apparently, buried in the nervous system of the baby chick is an engram there of that hawk. Campbell goes on further to remark that if all the hawks on the planet became extinct, that engram would still stay there 
in the nervous system of the chicks, uh, it would stay there, perhaps to be activated later on by some work of art representing a hawk. And perhaps uh, art does work in this way. Uh, it is certainly the case then, that for Campbell anyway, the human psyche is not a tabula rasa. Uh, these instincts and engrams are in there as well. Uh, we don't know exactly how to map them out. We know they're in there. And that there may be uh, centuries and millennia of experiences that we have had as hominids uh, encountering other species and animals that are now extinct, but for which the engrams, what he calls the innate, what Tim, Tinbergen calls the innate releasing mechanisms, sleep inside. Uh, the external stimuli are called sign stimuli, and they act like key tumbler mechanisms to open up and unlock the innate releasing mechanisms that produce immediately spontaneously preformed a priori patterns of behavior that take over instinctively. Art must work, Campbell says, somehow in a way that is similar to or analogous uh, to this process. And um, so he goes on to discuss that this is probably the basis for Jung's archetypes of the collective unconscious. This is probably what Jung is getting at with his idea that the unconscious is biologically grounded. There are certain responses or engrams that are buried in the human nervous system that myth somehow activates. The right image at the right time can produce the right response. And we know there are many of these uh, engrams buried in the nervous system, in the human nervous system. Uh, the, the infant's suckling response to the nipple must be another uh, similar kind of innate releasing mechanism. Experiments have also been done about interesting experiments about the reaction of the human infant to the human face. The infant will produce a smile between the ages of three months to six months old when shown a human face. Uh, now, we can make a fake human face. So what happens is you can make a, a fake face. And as long as it has asymmetrical eyes, one, eyes won't, one eye won't work. Asymmetrical eyes, no wrinkles on the forehead, and a nose. The mouth is not necessary to be there. You can show it to the infant between three and six months old, and the infant will spontaneously produce a smile. Another innate re releasing mechanism, apparently, that's buried in the human psyche there. And it's interesting that there's no, that the mouth doesn't need to produce a response. We think of the Australian Wangina beings that are represented with no mouths. Uh, to what degree that might activate innate releasing mechanisms uh, in the human being, we don't know in the human psyche. But clearly, there is some degree, some aspect here in which art acts in a way that unlocks these uh, spontaneous currents of emotion. He quotes A.E. Hausman uh, to the effect that uh, Hausman defines poetry. Uh, he says, I don't know how exactly to define poetry, but I can tell you what it does to me. Um, I have to be careful when I'm shaving, for instance, if I think of a line of poetry, it might give me goosebumps and the razor won't work across the skin with goosebumps on it. The hair might rise on the back of the neck. I might start getting tears. Uh, I might get a constriction in my throat. Depends on the work of art, but works of art can produce somatic physiological responses, and Campbell basically says this is how he thinks myth and religion works as well. It produces somatic physiological responses. I think he does make a mistake here. He goes a little bit too far when he says that all art basically works this way. It does not. The human intellect very much is also involved in understanding works of art and aesthetic appreciation. I think what he's talking about here is one kind of aesthetic appreciation of a work of art, the human physiological response. You might get goosebumps. But another way of appreciating a work of art is very well by learning about it, understanding about it, reading about it, and making associations as you're watching, let's say, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, didn't mean a lot to me the first time I saw it as a teenager, but years later, the more I learned about ritual, symbol, and myth, the more I saw in the film, the more my intellect was able to make associations, the better the aesthetic response it had on me. So indeed, I think the intellect is involved in the appreciation of works of art. It, 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 and as well as the pre-rational, instinctual, dark, what is it, five million year old man that, that lives within us is also involved. I think both of them have to be given equal weight, Apollo and Dionysus, once again, as it were. Then he makes this interesting observation. There's another kind of sign stimulus, um, which, he, which is known uh, by these biologists, and he's mostly quoting the Russian biologist Nikolai Tinberg in here, the supernormal sign stimulus. Um, this is even more interesting, I think. Where he talks about, he, he makes the point that there are certain, there's a certain species of butterfly that uh, prefers, uh, when it wants to mate, um, it'll chase a female butterfly that flies past 
uh, but it prefers the female butterflies that have darker wings. And so it'll go after those, the ones with darker wings. Now, you can make a butterfly that has even darker wings than any of the wings that would ordinarily naturally appear in nature, and that male butterfly is going to prefer the one with the fake darker wings that don't appear in nature. So that's called a supernormal sign stimuli because it doesn't appear in nature, has never appeared in nature, but nonetheless, the psyche, the nervous system, responds better to it. Uh, once again, we have a, p a possible key to the way art works in the human world. Uh, Campbell also makes the point that human females probably figured this out a long time ago when they started using cosmetics to beautify themselves. There is evidence of the use of coal to uh, outline the eyes going way back into the Neolithic. And so, uh, gentlemen, do not let feminists try to get you to think that women wearing, that the only reason they wear makeup uh, is because of social pressure. That's not the case at all. Uh, women figured this out a long, long time ago that males prefer the supernormal sign stimulus to the natural sign stimulus. Women figured that out. That comes before social pressures uh, to, for other females to conform. That's a much later development than the original figuring out of that actual supernormal sign stimulus that women figured out. And there is evidence, furthermore, Going way back to Neanderthals, a recent evidence that I think comes up, uh, from National Geographic, I remember reading not too long ago, that um, it is now thought that Neanderthals adorned their bodies with tattoos. Uh, sticks of black manganese have been found along with some red ochre, and it appears that they did use their own supernormal sign stimuli in adorning their bodies, and who knows what kinds of uh, aesthetic or sexual responses that may have produced. We don't know. That's supernormal sign stimuli. That's also part of the world of art. Um, so art is far more mysterious and produces a-rational, pre-rational, physiological responses that are way far more mysterious than any rationalist theory of art or myth or symbol or religion uh, can ever disintegrate and boil down to. Uh, so that is those two chapters. Uh, and then next we'll look at, uh, tomorrow we'll look at the uh, that's the a priori aspect of myth. And note that Campbell very much uh, follows Young here in this idea that myth appeals to engrams or innate releasing mechanisms that are in the human nervous system that function in a way that archetypes of the collective unconscious must also function somehow. But next he'll deal with the empirical aspects, the imprints of experience. Next. <laughs>